Tom Clark's 6M Podcast is a Boink Studios production. And now, on with the show. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to Tom Clark's 6M Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Clark, and in this episode, I'm joined by co-host Phil Lindsay. From the world of Hollywood comes a film starring one of the most bankable action stars of all time, set in a future where intelligent machines serve mankind until a mysterious death unravels that arrangement from the ground up. We're talking about iRobot. iRobot was directed by Alex Proyas on a screenplay by Jeff Venter and Akiva Goldsman, and was released in the United States on July 16, 2004 by 20th Century Fox. The film, which took several cues from the Robot series by Isaac Osmov, initially had nothing to do with the science fiction classic, but following the addition of various story elements from the series, the movie did credit Osmov's work as an inspiration. iRobot takes place in Chicago in the year 2035, when intelligent machines are being used in everyday life as service robots to help the public. The robots operate under three laws, the first of which prohibits them from harming humans. The rules also state that robots must obey orders and protect themselves unless either instance would result in harming a human. When Dr. Alfred Lanning, a founder of the U.S. robotics company, falls to his death, Detective Spooner is called in to investigate. Spooner has a deep resentment and distrust toward robots due to an accident that took his left arm. Though he was rescued, the robot responsible allowed a 12-year-old girl to die in the process. Spooner is paired with Dr. Susan Calvin from U.S. Robotics, who seeks to help him find answers to Lanning's death. The two soon encounter a robot named Sonny hiding in Lanning's lab, leading to a chain of events that would unfold in the film. U.S. Robotics CEO Lawrence Robinson becomes a prime suspect for Spooner, who is convinced that the robots are being programmed to turn against humans. The company's central artificial intelligence computer, also known as Vicky, becomes the focus of the story in the third act, when Spooner and Calvin fight back against the surge of the rebellious machines. iRobot made $353 million on a budget of $120 million. It opened number one at the box office and was met with generally favorable reviews from critics, who praised it as an action-packed thrill ride. A possible sequel was rumored since the film's release, but it has yet to be made official. Thanks to the action, the story, and the special effects, iRobot continues to be a favorite among science fiction fans all around the world. And that's the lowdown on iRobot. It's no secret that Will Smith is one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. Everybody talks about the Independence Day franchise and, you know, he was Ali and even the Pursuit of Happiness, a a role that was a little bit different for him. But he's, I mean, bad boys. There's so much great stuff that Will Smith has done over the years. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which we've covered here on the show. And uh, I love Will. I always have. I I think he's... uh, it's kind of weird for me to say that he's underrated as a rapper, even though he's got Grammys on his shelf from his rap career. But in this day and age, I think it's kind of easy to forget that, man, he was really good. Like, I don't think he, I don't know that he gets enough credit, but of all the stuff that he's done in terms of his acting, I don't know how often I hear iRobot even talked about. And the whole idea of doing this particular episode, I think it just kind of came up when we did the Matrix episode. And uh, Phil, you're probably the one that that said it, and I can't remember in, in what regard that you mentioned it, but it just sparked something in my head, and I was like, we should totally do iRobot, because I haven't seen that film in years, and uh, here we are. So, uh, what what do you think, man, like, it, in terms of, uh, uh, maybe not just for you personally, but overall, do you think this film gets talked about uh, enough, when, in terms of it being like a Will Smith flick, or is it sort of... I don't want to say it's lost, but is it one that you hear mentioned all that often? No, I think it's like towards the end of his uh, run as like a big blockbuster guy. And I think mm. because of that, some people don't talk about it as much as like Independence Day or like some of his bigger hits, like right. Men in Black. 2004, man. I, I, I'm i going to be straight with you. I, I kind of didn't realize it was that long ago. <laughs> I mean, I really... I don't know yeah. what year I was thinking, but dude, I didn't remember it being 04, man. Yeah, I mean, this uh, this was definitely that era where, you know, everything started to change toward the turn of, you know, the decade and everything became futuristic, quote unquote. Everything had to have an eye in front of it. 
everything was sleek and white. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think that's why the movie felt so relevant at the time. Um, and just in terms of, I, I feel like when we were talking about Matrix, I said it was interesting that he didn't do Matrix, but he ended up in another like futuristic sci-fi movie where he was battling the threat of artificial intelligence. That's what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. Uh, to your point, everything's white and it's polished and it's, you know, it's when Apple started taking over the world and now fast forward, what, 17 years later, which blows my mind. Apple's taken over the world. Hey, look, I sold out to Apple a long time ago. They own my soul. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got the iPhone, iPad, iMac. I got everything. Uh, I've got everything except the Apple branded on my freaking forehead right now. So, if it's the mark of the beast, I guess I'm in trouble, kids. That's what I'm trying to tell you, but I don't care. I just, I love the tech, man. I, I'm a tech whore when it comes to this stuff. I just can't help it. Um, So I know you watched this movie for the, uh, well, so, so how long has it been since you've seen the movie when you watched it again for this pod? I can't think of the last time. I actually don't remember the last time I actually watched it all the way through. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a while. <laughs> Same here. I'm going to be straight with you, man. It it could be. I, it sounds crazy to say the last time I saw it was in 04. I don't, I don't know if that's true, but now I'm going back through my head over the years. I don't recall sitting down going, hey, you know, I haven't watched this in a long time. Let's watch it. Maybe I did, and I just don't remember. But a lot of this movie, there was a lot of it I had totally forgotten about. Some was very familiar, but a lot of it I had completely forgotten about, man. Why do you think that is? Why do you think we don't, like, I guess it's personal opinion here, but um, why is it do you think people don't pick this movie up like they do some of those other ones? Because, like you said, it, it was at the tail end. Is it just not as popular? Maybe it didn't connect with people. How does it connect with you, or does it? Uh, well, I think it's partially because of the you know the turn of the decade. Also, coming into this era where um, the way we view media has changed so much. Um, mm. Because before, you know, it used to be it used to be you had to be at home in front of a TV, DVD player and all this other stuff to watch movies or now you can watch movies anywhere. You can stream movies everywhere. And I mean that was happening because portable DVDs were becoming a thing anyway. But I think we just consume more media than we used to. I think we watch a lot more movies because it's more accessible than it ever has been. Yeah, it's a good point. I can remember the portable DVD players and like the ones that plug up either battery operator plugging like the cigarette lighter of your car. Because we had one from my son and uh, then they started becoming like factory. Maybe they were factory at the time we had one, but we just had one in a bag like situated on the back of the headrest so he could have something to watch as we were going on a trip or vacation or whatnot. But you're right, man. It's a good point. Like you had to be stationary in front of something to be able to watch it and then everything technology started changing and it's crazy to think of where we are now. Um, so first thoughts after having watched this again in years, what's, what's your first reactions coming out of this? I think it's, I think it's fun for what it is. I think it's a fun sci-fi movie. Uh, some really cool visuals. Um, I don't think the story is as deep as it seemed at the time, <laughs> right? But it's still, a, it's still an interesting story. Um, uh, one of the things I didn't pick up, um, I feel like I've seen this so many times, but um, for some reason I saw like CPD logo on something. I was like, wait, this is supposed to be in Chicago? I didn't know. <laughs> oh, wow. Honestly, I don't even recall seeing that. Yeah, I think um, wasn't wasn't Will Smith's character, wasn't he originally like a, a detective for Chicago Police Department or something like that? Yeah, he's a homicide detective in the Chicago Police Department. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, you can answer this a lot better than I can. There, There's a couple of different shots of, like, the city. It's almost like from a drone, but obviously it's just a shot of the city. But it's obvious that it's been, you know, Photoshop and CG and extra buildings. Do you recognize any of, like, the the wide shots, like the, the cityscape? And, of course, they've just added in a bunch of futuristic buildings. I guess, there, there's, in other words, there's no landmarks there that that exist right now, right? Yeah, I'm trying to think when I watch it, it doesn't really look like Chicago to me. And I mean, I'm sitting thinking like, I guess when I did watch it, it does scroll across and it does say Chicago 2035. But right. 
Um, it doesn't have like it doesn't have like the what I would think the Chicago skyline looks like, and I think that's why it confuses me a little bit. The skyline looks so different. Um, the Sears Tower is still there, um, mm. but when you look at like some of the other buildings that like there's a building like in the middle that's taller than the Sears Tower, and again, I think that just throws me off because I'm used to the Sears Tower is the tallest building in the city. Um, but yeah, when you look at it. Um, I guess once you notice it and pay attention to it, it's like, oh yeah, this is Chicago. I, I guess I just never paid attention to that for some reason at the time, or maybe I forgot. Right. Well, it's an action-packed uh, flick, kids. If you've never seen it, uh, it's worth watching. Uh, I'm watching it back again for the second time here in the past two days, and I just got through the bit where the uh, the, the old man's house was demolished, and it's you know he's running at full full you know breakneck speed and he's shooting the hinges on the door with his big space gun from the future <laughs> and uh luckily hey phil those bullets are pretty good because that door blows off and he like surfs the door out the onto the water and saves the cat i mean he saved the cat i'm not trying to knock it it's an action flick everybody relax it's just you know sometimes action is a little bit over the top but it is what it is. Um, a lot of this movie I'd forgotten, like I said before. I, I like him. I could watch him in anything. But knee-jerk reaction, first thing that I started noting, and I don't know if I realized this at the time, there was a several moments in this film for me where it felt like he was, the direction was, hey, just be Will Smith. Crack wise. Be funny, <laughs> right? And like it fits in some parts. And then other parts, it's almost like, did we need this joke right there? Did he have to put this one liner here? Not that he's doing it, but it almost felt like, Hey man, we got to remind everybody. This is Will Smith uh flick. So will be funny. Like, yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Like that. it didn't fit. I can see that because his character is supposed to be like this, like jaded, um, bitter loner character, but he also is so what's the word I want to look at? He's, it's, he's he also comes off as very extroverted and very personable in yeah, yeah. in some of the scenes as well. So it's like, are you though? It doesn't seem like you are like this loner that lives in an apartment alone and hates what everybody else hates in technology. I don't know. Yeah, he's not introverted at all. Good point. He's and he seems to be uh, really tight with the captain. And yes. which is different. Um, and I kept, I kept thinking, man, is there a relation here that I don't remember? It, or, like, uh, I don't know. They just felt very close. Like, were they partners? And I forgot. Was it, it feels a lot more like, Hey, I answer to you and you're my boss. It didn't have that typical, you know, Starsky and Hutch where the chief's yelling at them every two seconds and a typical, you know, buddy detective movie or TV show. They felt like true friends, which I'd kind of forgotten about that. So that was different. Um, yeah. So there's, I mean, of course, obviously everybody, there. this movie feels different because it is set in the future. And dude, in 2004, 2035 was a long time away, but in 2021, not so much. So it's funny, like movies that come out this year will be set in like the year 2050 and then we'll get close to that. And then, well, we got to jump ahead even more. The whole concept of, you know, we got to talk about the tech because I want to get into the tech before we get in the cast. The cars. Everything's self-driving. And then like when he takes the wheel, everybody's like, what are you What are you driving your own car for? Have you lost your mind at these speeds? Are you crazy? And like he gets in trouble with the captain and everything. I'm like, oh my God, you've, you, what were you driving your own car for? And I'm like, man, is this like a big problem in the future? They're like, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I, I mean, all that stuff is, interesting when you watch it that he's seen as a renegade for going screw this i'm not letting this robot drive for me. I'm <laughs> right. or i'm not letting this robot do all of these menial tasks for me i can do it myself um it's 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 uh it's interesting and it's funny at times but at other times it's like i just is this realistic but then again when i think about it when i i think about times i've been on a road and there are some terrible drivers yeah you probably don't need to be driving that <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, uh, the, the concept, and I use that word twice here, the concept of like robots going into business for themselves and essentially turning heel. Uh, 
is is not a concept that anyone in this particular universe even buys into because they've never seen it happen before. And so like almost from the jump of this movie, we see Will Smith's character uh, who absolutely does not trust technology in the slightest. Um, Detective Spooner, that's his name. Don't know where the name came from. If there's a connection to that name and something else, I'm not too sure, but. Um, like like Arthur Spooner from King of the Hill, King of Queens. <laughs> ah, well, could be. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe it's related to him. Maybe this is all like he's a descendant of <laughs> Arthur Spooner. <laughs> I like that. We'll go with it. Dale Spooner. His first name is Dale. I mean, I it's it's fine, but like it's not Ray, it's not Steve, it's not, you know, Todd or something. It's it's Dell. I don't know. It seems I don't know. It's different, I guess. Um, uh, but yeah, man, like the whole concept of uh, um, robots uh, essentially going to the business for themselves, trying to take over maximum overdrive, Stephen King reality, where the machines just start taking over and, and fighting back and killing us. You know, like he's the only one. This whole movie kind of feels like the boy that cried wolf, where every time you turn around, he's like, I don't trust him. We got to we got to shoot him. And then everyone's like, God, would you? Would you stop? They're here to help. They'll drive your car. They service you. They bring your food. They run errands for you. They're here to help. They're everywhere. And man, in this in this universe, these things are everywhere. It's the norm. They're like pets almost. Like it's just the norm, man. They yes. it's crazy. Yeah. And they switch them out. I'm at that scene where they're switching out for the new uh, what do they call them? NS fives. And like this, it looked like service drawers from Star Wars. They had like no facial features and everything. You could tell that they're older models. NS5 looks very humanoid, very realistic, very lifelike. And it, at one point, Will Smith even says, Why do you give them faces? You know, it is very curious. Um, yeah, to, to make them disarming in a way, I guess. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. We got to make them blend in. And they do, for the most part, they're all very civil and polite. May I assist you? May I be of assistance? Can I help you with this? And then after a while, it's like, well, maybe he is hallucinating this, man. I think there's another version of this film that you could play it another way and say maybe he was he was losing his mind and, and imagined that they were a threat when really they weren't. Like, I don't know, dude. It's a little, a little messed up. But like <laughs> after, after a while, you don't see the threat until it happens. What about the idea of, because you and I, during The Matrix, we talked about this, about, you know, all the AI that's that's being, we're just on the cusp of the, the very beginnings of it now in 2021. I'm sorry, dude, but I'm an alarmist when it comes to this stuff. I think it's a horrifying idea and it's a terrible idea to create AI because if the matrix doesn't happen. I robot could, I mean, is there, is there, is there a world in which AI doesn't like strike back? Doesn't, you know, become a, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Am I too alarmist here? Or we should just keep developing the technology and see what happens. I don't know. I think because when you look at the world as it exists, like there's always conflict in the world. And I think to to think that there would be no conflict with AI would be kind of naive because there's always conflict in some kind of way. And I just still go back to every time I think about it. Ultron took one look at the internet and he was like, no, 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 no. Human beings have to go. They're the problem. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. uh, So, uh, and, and even, uh, uh, Chai, was it Chai McBride? I don't want to mispronounce his name. As uh, Lieutenant John Bergen is basically, I keep calling him the captain, but it's uh, uh, it's Will's uh, uh, police uh, lieutenant here in the movie. He uh, he even says something. I, we need to get back to the good old days of when humans killed humans. I think, I think he said it. Uh, yeah, I just I think it's like you're just you're asking for trouble. I don't know. I don't want this to become a platform of. Tom waves his hand at technology or waves his, shakes his fist at technology. I love technology. I just said I'm an apple whore. I am totally can't help it. Um, I think technology is good. I just think, you know, it's that line from the Krusty Krab training video when he, when they're talking about uh, Mr. Krab's fear of robot, robot overlords helps, helps keep the balance of technology in check. Cause it's the truth. I have a fear of robot over, overlords, man. And this movie doesn't help much. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I think the larger thing is this. I just feel like corporations have found their way to slink into everything. And the idea of artificial intelligence in the hands of corporations that I already see as 
pretty evil or as close to evil in the world as we can get. Yeah. It frightens me a little bit, especially with um, all of the stuff that you can think of with our data and stuff that they already have their hands in. It is, I don't know, it is a little bit scary. It is because they'll have an agenda. It won't just, the tech won't be here to help humanity. They'll have an agenda because they're trying to sell a product or they're trying to, like you said, get up in your business, spy on you essentially. I mean, yeah, there's all kinds of avenues this thing could go down and has gone down in, in other uh, like TV shows and movies and whatnot, books, obviously. Um, before we dive into the cast here, man, um, the connection of this movie to to various different uh, sci-fi properties. I mean, it, it's I I don't know if it's necessarily based on anything specific, but you know Isaac Osimov, uh, probably the best, most well-known sci-fi writer maybe of all time. Yeah, I mean I've read quite a bit of his stuff, and he is he's a master. There's no doubt about it. Did you ever remember hearing about, oh, we're, we're basing this off that, or was it just the the name of the movie that they did, or maybe the, the overall themes, or what kind of connection was there here? I don't know if they, I don't know if I ever heard that there was. Um, I don't know. Um, when I think about it, I guess it is. Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess I never drew a comparison to the two before this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, but see, this is the era where it was a lot of robot movies coming out. Like, well, that's true. Yeah. Um, that what's the Robin Williams movie with the robot? And he's the robot. Wasn't that close to this? Ah, oh, uh, God, I'd forgotten all about that. Um, shit, man. Bicentennial Man. Yeah. Uh, I could see like some comparisons to that because he was like different than the other robots, and that's kind of close to what Sonny's story is here. Right. Um, huh. I'm that's sure you could. I'm sure you could draw comparisons to other sci- sci-fi. Like I'm sure there's like, I don't know, like I'm sure there's like hints to Metropolis in there because everything in some way hints back to Metropolis. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the design of, of the a, of the NS5 kind of looks like that also, which is, ironically enough, where Lucas got the idea for 3PO was uh, uh, Metropolis. So that, that uh, like, the droid face and the droid body and everything was sort of where they got the uh, inspiration to design 3PO. Um, so the screenplay was written by Jeff, Jeff Venter and Akiva Goldsmith from a, a screen story by Venter based on his original screenplay, Hardwired, and suggested by Isaac Osimov's 1950 short story collection of the same name. So it's, you know, suggested, inspired, but not necessarily taken from anything. Uh, but you can't go wrong. If you're using Os- Osimov as a, as a jumping off point, you've already got a pretty good foundation. You know, I don't know if this movie is as much about the tech as it is about the themes behind it. Like, when, you know, we're giving up and we're allowing these things, this it's this AI into our existence. They become part of the everyday fabric of our lives. What happens when that tech either stops functioning or starts doing things we don't want it to do? And it's kind of like the future we ended up in, where, you know, when the internet goes down, it's kind of a really, really big deal. Like it's not it doesn't just affect a handful of people. It affects everybody at home and at work and stores banking, everything, food, transportation, everything. It's just when it goes down or there's a tech issue, when technology doesn't behave the way you want it to, the whole world could come to a standstill, which is kind of frightening. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is more the literal sense of the word anyway, which I get it. Uh, Let's talk about the cast, man. Bridget, we've already talked about Will, of course. We've talked a little bit about the lieutenant. We'll circle back to him. Bridget Moynihan, and if you'd asked me to tell you uh, uh, her name, I wouldn't have been able to do it because she's just got one of those faces where I'm like, oh, I know her from this movie and that movie. I don't know if I ever could have told you her name, which either shows my ignorance or maybe shows something else. I don't know. But she's Dr. Susan Calvin. And I don't know who I would have gotten for this, but it kind of feels like she was really good. Just that sort of quirky, kind of withdrawn to herself, living in her own little bubble. Not doesn't have very many people skills, but I thought she was really good in this man. Right, yeah, I thought she was good in this as well. Um, 
I can't remember offhand anything else I've seen her in, which is kind of interesting. Like, usually I'm a, oh, yeah, she was in this and she was in this. Um, I can't think of anything offhand that I've seen her in. Um, oh, she's in uh, John Wick, right? Was she in she, Chapter 2? She was. I forgot all about that. Um, yeah, wow. Well, yeah, she did well here, I thought, in just kind of like this quirky doctor role. And, of course, they got to throw in the romantic undertones in there. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. They never hooked up, but she, like, touches bare naked chest. Had a little moment of, you know, let me put my fingers on you. And uh, kind of thought it was going to go somewhere, but didn't go anywhere. It's kind of weird uh, uh, for... for Two characters who obviously have some sort of connection, but like I, they don't even kiss in this movie, do they? I don't even remember them even kissing in this. No, I don't think they do. Well, that's different. I, as I said earlier, kids, there's several things about this movie that's a little bit different. Um, Alan Tudyk as Sonny, the voice of the NS5, dude. I will sing Alan Tudyk's praises from here till the end because he so deserves it because he's freaking phenomenal. I don't think I've ever seen him do anything bad. He's so good, man. Like, perfect voice here. Again, I don't know who I would have gotten, but he was great. Yeah, I mean, I feel like if you are a part of any kind of fandom of any kind, like, you know who Alan Tudyk is. Um, He's done so many great things as a voice actor. He's done so many great things on screen. I mean, whether that be like Firefly, Serenity and all that stuff, or, you know, doing a uh, Disney Pixar stuff. He's just been everywhere, and I think he always he always does well at it. Um, and I think he did well here. Yeah, he's great, man. Um, Tucker and Dale versus Evil, which we've got to do on the show sometime, which is a great freaking movie. He's in that. Um, he was a Steve the Pirate in Dodgeball, and I love that freaking movie as well. Um. He's so good. Everything he does is good. And he's a fanboy. He's a, he's a nerd. Um, yeah, I love this guy. He's just perfect. He's got... It's it's a neutral voice. It doesn't suggest an accent. It doesn't suggest, okay, he's part... He's from part of the, this part of the country or whatever. Because the AI shouldn't have a voice that's, you know, shouldn't sound like the Bronx. Shouldn't sound like, you know, the South. It should just be a neutral speaking voice um and he's got a very neutral speaking voice obviously even though he can do characters and whatnot i thought it was really cool and it just fits um bruce greenwood as the guy that's the head of the the evil corporation that we've talked about well one of them in the movie it's fictional was it u.s robotics i think and uh i i, I love greenwood i i his biggest claim to fame for me when I first knew him uh, was in the, uh, was in the uh, Kennedy movie about uh, the Cuban missile crisis. Right. Yeah. That's where I first, uh, first saw him. It's funny, man. Cause when we first see him in this flick, we, you kind of think he's the bad guy. You're like, Oh, he's got something to hide. He's going to be the heel. I can already see it. But you know what? He kind of ends up not being the heel. Like, he might have been hiding some stuff, but at the same time, it was like, he doesn't really feel like he did anything wrong because he ends up getting killed in this movie. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, he plays into, you know, what I was saying earlier about fear of corporations. Like, he is definitely, like, the head of this big, you know, huge company, and you think, like, oh, he's the guy because, you know, none of these guys have our best interests at heart. Um, I think he plays the role well, and I mean, I've seen him in other tons of other things, and he's been great in them. Um, so I, you know, wasn't surprised. You know, of course, now you know, having seen so many things, and like today, me reviewing it, I'm thinking like, yeah, yeah, I've seen him in tons of things. Yeah, he's got a great sense of humor too, man. He's he can be a yeah. very funny guy. Um, the movie I mentioned earlier, kids, is Thirteen Days. It's good. It's it's a very it's a historical piece. It's not like this flick where it's action packed. It it goes at its own pace, but I I recommend it. I think it's a good watch. Um, yeah, I think he was cast extremely well here, and uh, he looks the part too. He looks like the evil corporate white guy. Which I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's, 
it's kind of the truth anyway in real life. So if that's if that's who you need, that's who you cast. And I think he, yeah. And like, it's funny because Will's character, uh, Detective Spooner, is slamming him from like the jump. When he's he's like, I got an, I got an idea for a new commercial for it. It's not really my thing, but here you go. And then he's just starts crapping on the guy's company. And I'm like, you just got there. So yeah, he's he's for sure a wise cracking detective, um, which kind of feels like generic on and of itself. But uh uh yeah, I mean it works, I guess. And uh but no, I, I think he's really good in this. James Cromwell, another guy that if you're a nerd, uh if you into this kind of sci fi genre at all, then you're gonna know who Cromwell is. I mean, he's done Star Trek, he's done God, I, I don't even know if I can list how much th- how many things he's done over the years, man. This guy's been everywhere. Yes. Um, Space Cowboys, The Green Mile, Spider Man Three, um, Big Hero Six, Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom. Uh, dude, he's just been everywhere, man. This he's so good because no matter who he's cast as or what what his role is, he just. It just feels like the character. It doesn't feel like, oh, there's that Cromwell guy again. It just, when you start <laughs> watching his performance, man, he just feels like the character. I think he's great. Yeah, I mean, he 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 has a look. He looks like a like uh, authority figure in some way. He looks like mm-hmm. if you put him in like this kind of thing, like he has like the scientist look. Like he just he. <laughs> For whatever reason, he has the he just has the look, and you know he's I've never seen him in anything where he didn't do well. Um, I think this is kind of one of those other roles where it's just like one of those serviceable roles, and he just he just did well. Yeah, he really did. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, Chai McBride earlier as Lieutenant John Bergen. Again, I love that it's not a typical the chief screaming at me, he's mad. And you know, the mayor's, the mayor's on my ass, that kind of thing. <laughs> Cause you always get that. You always get that in the action flicks. <laughs> McBain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all the time. City hall's on the phone for you. It's like, Oh crap. You know, and they're all mad at each other. And um, he's awesome. I thought he fit really well. I, it feels like I should know him from other stuff and maybe I do. But if you said to me, Tell me what else he's been in. I don't know if I could do it off the top of my head, man. How familiar are you with his work? Oh, uh, of course. When I think of him, I always think of Undercover Brother. Because he's hilarious in there. Oh, I he's forgot like, about that. He's like, the, he's like the chief. He's funny <laughs> in that. Um, I believe he's in... I, I believe he's in one of those DMX movies. I think it's Credit to the Grave. I, I might be wrong. Oh, um, yeah. Um, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's, uh, Bow Wow's dad in that movie, the, the role, the roller skating movie. Roll Bounce. Um, Roll Bounce, yep. Yeah. Um, and of course, he's in What's Love Got to Do With It? I always think of he's, uh, Ike Turner's friend. That's right. Oh, man, not for nothing. I, I think I've only seen that particular flick once, and I came into the room the other day, and my wife is rewatching it. She hadn't watched it in a bit, and it's, it's, you know, no easy way to say this, kids, but it's the rape scene in like the bathroom. And oh, yeah, I, I dude, horrible. I had no recollection of how insanely horrible that scene is. And I'm looking at my wife going, I can't believe this made it into the theater. Like it's these are big name actors in this flick. And I'm like, I'm like, anyway, different story, but I was blown away. But I I forgotten he was in that until you just mentioned it, because I didn't like stick around and watch the whole movie with her, but yeah, I mean the the scene I always think about is, um, of course, it's horrible. Like they're having a fight and they're having the infamous eat the cake anime scene, right. and like afterwards he's like, "Man, this cake good, Frost." And that's who that's who <laughs> McBride plays is is Frost. That's this cake good, Frost. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, it's not fun. It's not funny, but it's funny, right? So I mean, that's just. <laughs> You you have to give Lawrence Fishburne his his credit for making Ike Turner into this multifaceted character in this thing. Like he's a horrible person in this movie, but he is just so he's so good in this role. Like I don't think Lawrence Fishburne gets nearly enough credit for that movie. I totally agree. It makes you wonder if he made the character more complex than the man actually was. Like- yeah, I mean because <laughs> Ike Turner in real life is like. He has like stage fright issues. He has all these other like 
weird issues. And he he got all those things across well, but he also he also did a great job of of showing why I could have possibly been like a rock star at one point. Yeah. Oh, don't get me started on on how influential he was and how much of a groundbreaker he was for his time. He totally was. I mean, he yeah. was very good. He was in demand. He was very smart. And then there's the whole other side where he's a complete, you know, scum of the earth jerk. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, if if you haven't seen it yet, um, the um, HBO documentary about Tina Turner is excellent. It's really, really good. I keep um, meaning to watch it, and I still haven't done it. They they cover what's love got to do with it at a little bit in it. They cover the move the you know when the movie came out, and then the book that it's based off of. And one of the things I never really thought about is how traumatizing it was for Tina to see it on screen and have to relive it so much. I mean, it, she had already gone through it in real life, and then having to relive it to write the book, and then having to relive it for the movie. And then having to do press for the movie and constantly get asked about it constantly. Oh my god! It had god. to be traumatizing, and she talks about that in the documentary. It's it's sad. So she's getting interviewed, and the guy's like, "Oh, so let's talk about the rape scene. Hey, you want to talk about it?" And she's like, what? "No, no, I'm not talking about what." Yeah, it's it's terrible. Um, Horrible. Yeah. Great documentary, uh, though. I dude, I've got to check it out. I keep me. It's on my list. It's on my to do list. I just haven't done it yet. Tom Clark 6M Podcast is sponsored in part by Radius Law Group. Every day, Radius helps individuals, families, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations throughout North Carolina, Florida, and Pennsylvania resolve their legal issues by providing effective legal counsel in the areas of estate planning, as well as elder law and Medicaid. Radius Law holds the radical belief that working with a lawyer can indeed be enjoyable. So give them a call at 1-800-519-5667 for more information and tell them that Tom Clark 6M Podcast sent you. Here's one I forgot was in this flick. Um, Shia LaBeouf. I had totally forgotten because he's like 12 in this movie. Uh, totally forgot that. Dude, did you remember he was in this? I remember because this was around that time where Shia LaBeouf was uh, positioned to be one of the biggest stars in the, in Hollywood. Like he was everywhere at one point. Yeah. I mean, it was just only a matter of time before he became a leading man. And, you know, now it seems like, what were we thinking at that time? <laughs> Cause, but he, I mean, he was everywhere. I mean, he was in an Indiana Jones movie. It looked like they were positioning to take uh Harrison's spot at some point. Yeah. Did the, all of the transformer stuff. Like he was, he was huge in the early 2000s. Uh, Chocolate Falcon's good. I think he was very good in that. Um, I think that's what that film's called. Yeah, he's a he's a great actor. I'm, I'm not, you know, saying this to say that people were wrong in the sense that he couldn't do it. I just think it was just another one of those things where, you know, he had been a part of Hollywood for so long that yeah. you know it was impossible for him to not have baggage. Very true. Very true. Good point. Um. So that's like that's like the core cast here. There's some other folks uh floating around here and there. Um the all right, so so like the central core, we'll talk about this. Fiona Hogan does the voice of Vicky. And Vicky is like uh, like the CPU maybe of this whole deal where she's like in charge of all this. And we don't really know what's going on until like three quarters of the way through the flick, but Vicky is virtual interactive kinetic intelligence. Cute, but it works. Um, I, you know, again, I, it's been years since I've seen this, Phil. I don't know if I could, when I saw this, I don't think I had figured out that Vicky was the one behind it and not Sonny and not the doc. I I didn't even know if I realized it. And then when it came to me, I'm like, Oh my God, they've been looking in the wrong direction. It was like sleight of hand. Did you remember right. like figuring that out before it was revealed? Yeah. I, I wouldn't have guessed Vicky at all, but it's like, uh, what's the, uh, main villain in Tron is it master control. Yeah. It's kind of like, kind of like a play on master control. If you really think about it, like it's true. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't put two and two together at first when I first saw it. So we touched on this briefly uh, toward the start of this um, episode. 
uh, about the matrix, dude, you, you brought a lot of the, the, uh, uh, different themes about what the matrix could translate to what maybe it meant then and none of us knew it. And now what it could mean. I mean, is this movie deep at all to that extent? Is it just fun sci-fi? Because I got some thoughts on what some things that maybe I'm seeing, but I'm curious if you've, are you familiar with anything that people have, have connected to this over the years or if one thing is representative of another or anything like that? I mean, I don't think it's as deep as some of the other artificial intelligence movies that came around around the same time. Um, Like I said, Bicentennial Man is probably a better movie because it it covers some of the AI stuff and, you know, kind of this Pinocchio story that they do with uh, robots. I think it did it better in some ways. Even the Spielberg movie with um, Haley Joe Osmond kind of did it better as well. Um, Even though I don't like the ending of the movie, it's kind of tacked on. Uh, AI, that's the name of that movie. That's it, yeah. Um, um, well, I think it's clearly like a Pinocchio theme here where, you know, there's the one robot in Sonny that is special and he's not like all the rest of them and he just wants to be considered, you know, real because he, you know, has, quote unquote, a soul. Um, and so, and then there's also all of these stuff like how we over-rely on technology and I think that's like the thorough line of the movie is just how much we rely on technology. And it's, it's probably, it's not nearly as deep as matrix or some of the other movies. Um, but it's entertaining. It is. And, you know, I was thinking about Spooner's backstory when we finally see what his hangup is about technology. Of course, he's got the, you know, he's sort of got the winter soldier arm happening. Uh, the left arm is not really him. It is robotic. Uh, this is how he knows. Uh, this is how he knows the doc. Um, uh, by the way, I don't know if we mentioned this, but James Cromwell, the character portrays is Dr. Alfred Lanning, which is this character uh, commits suicide. At least we, we, we pretty sure it was suicide at the beginning of this movie. And that starts the whole ball rolling. And, and he and Spooner had this connection and it's because of the army. We didn't really know that. We kind of thought something was up, but we didn't really figure it out till later. Um, dude, the, the story about the cars in the water and, and the little girl is like in the car and she's sinking to the bottom. I don't know, dude, part of me thinks, wouldn't that scene have been more impactful if it had been his daughter, if it, they'd been in the same car and if she was maybe buckled in and he wasn't and, the robot thought, well, he's easier to save. I did the percent. I did the math. Now that is a reason to hate. That is a reason to loathe. Not that he shouldn't hate, but I don't, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm answering my own question before you can. Uh, the fact that he's got this humor thing all through the flick, maybe there would be no humor if it had been his own actual daughter that died in the water. What do you think about the backstory of Spooner here? I thought the backstory is really good. Um, and I, I think in your take, it makes it more personal for him. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could still, you could still kind of make it personal, but I feel like it's not as personal because it's all about service. Like, you know, he's a police officer, he's a public mm. servant. Yeah. And you're also in contrast with robots. They're supposed to be like servants here. And so he's like, no, they are, they cannot do what I do because they don't know how to make the judgment calls that I make. You know, when you make the judgment calls into this idea of logic, then that's not always the right judgment call. And I think that was always his take. Like they can't do stuff in the field that a human can. You know, that's, that's true with anything, any industry, any industry that has incorporated machines onto the floor or at the, the heart of the process. I mean, productivity goes up a thousand percent, maybe more. That's great. But like to his point in this flick, snap judgment decisions made based in this, in the second that you have to make it. And AI can't do that. So like, yeah. And, and you know, an AI is unfeeling. Like right. you, you're looking at it like, okay, well, she's easier to say. I mean, he's easier to say, but he's lived an entire, he's lived an entire life. Excuse me. And she hasn't like her life is, you know, still in front of her. And, you know, us as humans, you know, you know, you as a dad or anyone else our our personal experiences would come into play and say, no, you have to save the kid first because, you know, 
I've I've been here for a whole thirty plus years. Like I'm good. Like save the kid. Right, right. Which is basically what he's yelling at this thing as it's pulling him out of the water. <laughs> save her! No, <Yeah>. no. <laughs> and you know it, it, it. The car is right there. Like he says, he makes a comment that the robot, the robot's thing was there was only eleven percent chance to save the girl. I'm like the car's right there. If he had just swam past Will. Bad, you know, broke the glass of the other car and pulled her out. She probably could have saved her. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah, I'm sure it's a mathematic thing, and that's I I think that's to his point. Um, he's like, well, you know, I in that moment would have done something different, but when you're just judging everything by numbers, then you know, you might not make the right decision. And I mean, that's. That goes into a ton of things that we look at today where everything is a numbers conversation or some kind of metrics. And, you know, there's no human right or wrong behind that. Right. You know, it's funny because when we first see Sonny, he kind of looks like the villain. He kind of looks like he's, he's a robot. So obviously he's cold, mechanical. But when he starts showing a human side. It's almost scary. Like, how can it, how can he say these things? How can he use his words like live and die? And you're like, he's an AI. What's going on? I thought they did extremely well with like throwing you off the scent and sort of, again, sleight of hand where you're kind of, cause dude, I don't know about you, but I suspected Sonny of, of just awful from the very beginning. Cause his delivery, the way he speaks, the way he looks at you, it's almost like, yeah, this is Stone Cold Killer right here, man. I thought they did really great with this character. Yeah. Um, I think it just, you know, it just plays into our our fear of, you know, artificial intelligence as is. And then you're also looking at it through um, Will's character, Spooner, who is always antagonistic to him from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Um and so you also are looking at it like he's on his heels and he's being defensive, but you're not looking at it like that because he's not a human being. So he's just looking like, why is this robot being defensive? Like, what? It's funny too, because uh, seeing how far the tech has come, I love that you get a glimpse of, as we said before, like the, the robots from before had what looked to be two eyes and like a mouth slit which you just assume as a speaker right there. So humans could hear it talk, but like, it definitely looks like droids from star Wars. And then what you're looking at with the NS five is completely updated. It's like the new iPhone compared to the first Samsung galaxy. You just can't, it, there's no comparison physically operations wise, everything in between. There's just no comparison at all. I love that you get to see that transition, but it's almost like they went from, it's almost like these models have been here for like 30 years or something. And then the NS fives are brand new. Like there was nothing in between very few models that I saw the course of this movie look very different until the NS fives come along. And it's like, well, this is modern tech. I mean, uh, the whole deal about, you know, uh, landing, putting like a, a different, like added things in sunny. He's got like a different processor. He's got another way to think. And he did it all for a reason because basically he can't escape because Vicky's got him like essentially held hostage. So Sonny's whole creation is to get him out of there, which I find fascinating. That's a lot to unpack. But when yeah. you get to that point in the story, I'm like, oh my God, this totally makes sense now. Yeah. I mean, when you look at his whole design and all the design of the NS5, they are translucent and, you know, it's kind of like they have nothing to hide because you can see all of their inner workings. The only thing that tries to um, disarm you is their face because they have like facial expressions and like eyes and like human features in their in in, in their facial. Um, but all the rest of it is is meant to be disarming. Like it's all of it is like like I said, translucent. Like there's nothing encased or covered. Yeah, good call. It doesn't feel solid. It does feel like. <laughs> like you could poke it with a stick and it would react. It's not, yeah, not like encased in metal. That's a good point. Um, I don't know, man. I, I, I don't. I mean, the the technology side of this is it's true. The whole idea of, you know, do we rely too much on it? the answer is yes, obviously. 
I mean, if you're relying on it for the right reasons, that's a whole different thing. But if when when 90% of the technology used for is for entertainment, yeah, that did kind of can feel, you know, maybe we do rely on it too much. And then people rely on it for the news, which is a whole other conversation. Uh, you know, a lot of that can be scary as well. But I don't know. It, maybe there's some other stuff happening here. And I again, I don't know. I can't see her and tell you I've done deep dives on this and research what all the other the fans are thinking and what science fiction guys are thinking. But I don't know. Yeah. Do you think the idea of like like the oppressed sort of rising up against their captors or rising up against you know the establishment or against the authority? Does any of that really come into play here with the AI, you think? Or do they it kind of feels like they're hinting at that at some points of this film, but they never really they never really dive in head first. Is that an area maybe that they they'd stay away from? Or cause the Matrix really tackled it big time. Like Yeah. Um I I do in, in Sunny Story there is some of that. Um I don't know if it's told as well. Hmm. Um I, I definitely believe like there is a conversation there about you know data data uh and apply to real life experience like i don't care how much data you have on something how much you study something um you know it just doesn't compare to have like real life experience and be out in a field or do something um and i, I think there's a lot of that here mm-hmm um, so evidently, uh, the film, it says here, the film renames Osmov's U.S. Robots and Mechanical Men to U.S. Robotics, USR, the modern manufacturer named after the fictional company and depicts the company with a futuristic USR logo. Um, product placements. Let me tell you <laughs> something, brother. Not just the cars, obviously, uh, because, you know, we get to see, uh, uh, Audi's in this. We we, t- we see a FedEx robot. JVC's represented. I am a massive Chuck Taylor guy. Like I got the Jordans, but I've got like I, I can sit here and count the number of pairs of of Chuck Taylors I have, but I don't know if I can remember. Will puts on those vintage 2004 leather Chuck Taylors, which is the minute I see him put them on, I'm like, why did I never buy that pair of shoes? Cause like I've seen them a, a bunch of times. Uh, this again, dude, you were talking about evil corporations and stuff. We kind of hinted at a lot here. Product placement's big in this flick, man. This whole thing kind of feels like a big commercial, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. And that's why I feel like in some ways it's not as deep as it wants to be because it's mm. like, you are, you know, you're you're pointing to evil corporations in some ways, but this entire movie is is based in like <laughs> like corporate like greed or you know commercialization. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure there's some of that here in terms of like the robots because everyone has one, and you know, I'm sure there's something to be said about like conspicuous consumption and consumerism, but. Like I said, the movie itself is draped in consumerism because yes. there's so much, like you said, product placement. <laughs> yeah, you're playing into it. You're you yourself are playing into it. Like, yeah, yeah. It's it's hard to soapbox in a movie like this because this does. I mean, maybe you feel at the end of this thing, uh, maybe this is just a good popcorn sci-fi movie, and there's nothing else. Yeah, which um, is okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's absolutely okay. I just think it it came towards the tail end of a lot of other ones that were a little bit more thought provoking. Mm. Um, yeah. Cause I mean, when you think of some of the themes of the other ones, I think they are um, expounded on a little bit better. Well, dude, if you want to talk about product placement, if, if kids, if you need any more convincing, this is good. The Aldi RSQ was designed especially for the film to increase brand awareness and raise the emotional appeal of the Audi brand. Objectives that were considered achieved when surveys conducted in the U.S. showed that the Audi RSQ gave a substantial boost to the image ratings of the brand in the States. It also featured it features an MV Augusta F4 SPR motorcycle. So that right there 
may have been the scariest part of this film. Not that AIs may take over, but that a corporation <laughs> got their product in this film, designed a product for the film, and then saw the sales of that product boost through the roof because of the film. That's like, that's terrifying to me. I don't know why, but it's it's like that nameless or that like that faceless corporate entity full of a, bu a bunch of rich guys, and they're having that kind of impact. Horrifying, Phil, I submit to you. Horrifying. Yes. <laughs> Crazy, man. I don't I didn't know any of that at all. And you go you go click on that car everybody, the Audi uh, RSQ. It's essentially it's the same ride. It's the same ride. It's it's freaking it's I mean, it's like it's it's smooth, man. It's a smooth ride. I'm not going to lie, but it looks like I don't know. Looks like a mouse for an Apple computer. I swear to god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, yeah. There's a there's a big commercial element to this movie. It's very much like, hey, look at this. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> when you're done looking at that, look at this. Yeah. Uh, he's old school, man. He's got the chucks. He's got the crotch rocket like the motorcycle. Um, I mean, that's done for our benefit, I'm sure. Because yeah. you, if you've just got futuristic stuff and no one's there to remind you what time you're currently in, you're kind of going to have a disconnect. But and plus, it makes him look cool too, right? So yeah, it gives good. him the it gives him the edge of you know before it's it's he's being he's being rebellious for driving on his own. Now he's on a motorcycle, guys. Like he's he's a super <laughs> rebel now. <laughs> Does this movie feel like a vehicle for him personally, or do you think anybody could have popped into this film and and took the lead and maybe were I mean, maybe we're not talking about this movie on terms of the Matrix like we did before, but maybe we talk about it in a different tone. Do you think anybody else, or is this maybe purely a vehicle just for Will? You think? Uh, I think there's enough here for it to be an interesting sci-fi movie, but his his personality is such a big part of um, the main character that it's kind of weird to think of it without him. Right. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I mean. I couldn't imagine, I mean, in some ways you, I can kind of see how someone would think it's a miscast because I think, I think sometimes his personality is, I don't want to say overbearing, that seems a little harsh, but yeah. it seems like it kind of undermines like the character dynamic. And you know, whenever there's like a really popular flick, even the films that maybe aren't crazy popular, but they get enough of a following, like a cult following, the first thing we start talking about are sequels. I mean, it's just yeah. inevitable, right? Dude, there's been like, in 2007, there was some stuff said about a possible sequel. And it's like, nah, it was kind of dismissed because supposedly there was, there was a part two being written and said it would be set in outer space. And I'm like, you know... Come to think of it, at the end of this film, it kind of feels like they've checked all the boxes. It doesn't really feel like there's a part two here. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I could see it being a part two if you want to get more into Sonny's character and make it like this buddy cop character, buddy cop thing where it's Sonny and uh, Spooner uh, solving stuff together. Hmm. Uh, but I don't know how many people are that interested in that. That's a good point. Cause I swear, dude, I still, I, I still say it. Kind of feels like this movie's out of sight, out of mind. That unless it's in a marathon or unless it's an anniversary year for it, that people just aren't thinking about this flick. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's. Uh, I don't want to say odd because these things happen. Not every flick can be the Matrix. Which, by the way, kids, if you haven't listened to the Matrix episode, you're missing out. Go check it out. Cause it's really good. I think. Um. That that episode spoiled me going into this because I kept thinking, oh, I can't wait to tackle our robot and see what kind of stuff we can come up with. But yeah, it's funny because a movie like The Matrix kind of ruins you for something else. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, we're we're going from one of the best sci-fi movies ever to yeah. well, you, that was essentially like a you know summer popcorn movie. Yeah, that's true. Will's very good at that, and that's not a knock on Will. Uh, but yeah. He, yeah, yeah, he's Mr. July at one point. <laughs> oh, very good point. Yeah, for sure. 
Which, you know, I, I, I'm i still to this day say that Independence Day Part 2 could have been, you know, because I think it was I've, money kept them apart, but that was crazy. He wasn't in I don't money. think I've seen Independence Day 2. You're not missing much. I don't think I've seen it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I've seen some things, man, and some stuff. I wouldn't recommend it. I'm just saying, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it's not bad, but it's not good, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I think money kept them apart at the time because he wanted like a bunch, and they said, "Nah, I'm not doing it," which is smart. Let's take make a sequel to the biggest, arguably of its generation, sci-fi movie, and let's yeah, let's don't have the main guy back. Like Will Smith is on board for dude. You back the money truck up and give the guy what he wants because it's a hit, and he'll make it a hit for you, especially for the name if it's called Independence Day. Are you kidding? But yeah, yeah. they didn't didn't do it. Um, you know, like it's interesting going back to the beginning of this when you noted, uh, and rightfully so, this was sort of at the tail end for him. I mean, going back and thinking about it, man, what if this movie had blown up? What if it was like freaking massive? What if it had made a ton of money and they were talking about sequels and it was well received and it was, oh my God, this movie's great. He may still have just kept going as the franchise guy. You know what I mean? Because this would have been yet another franchise for him. It seems to be an exhausting route for any actor, but he seemed to have that magic touch maybe up until this one, unless I'm just reading it wrong. Yeah. I mean, I feel like he's done other things since then that are good movies, but I feel like the day and age of him being like, uh, uh, you know, the leading man that he was in the early, in the early two thousands, like 19, like, like the late nineties, like he had left the era because he he wasn't ahead of many franchises anymore. That's when he started doing more. Um, I don't want to say personal, more intimate movies and yeah. kind of outside the blockbuster realm. Because I mean, Hitch is a great movie, love Hitch, but I wouldn't say that it's a blockbuster. It's kind of like a rom com. I don't know. Like I guess you, I guess you call it a rom com. Um, and it's fantastic. Uh, Pursuit of Happiness, also same thing. Great movie. Oh, yeah. um, I Am Legend, great movie. Um, uh, I think Hancock is after that. Don't get me started on Hancock. Hancock could have been. Hancock could have been much better than what it was. Yeah. Um, but he still had like a run of good movies after that. But it wasn't what he started as. Um, like he started as this big blockbuster movie guy. Um. I think Seven Pounds is in there somewhere after that. I don't remember what year Seven Pounds came out. But I really enjoy Seven Pounds. Yeah, it's a good flick. Really good flick. And, you know, after having after having conquered the box office the way he did many times, yeah. at, that, at that point you want to have more meat on the bone. Like, the sizzle's great, man. The sizzle's great, but you want more steak at that point. I can't blame him for wanting more steak. It's like... I want to be remembered for something more than just maybe. Hey, listen, maybe this wasn't in his head, and I'm just putting thoughts in the guy's head I've never met. I don't know, but it kind of seems from a distance like, hey, this was great. I'm the franchise guy. Great, I got money in the bank. Awesome, got new cars and stuff. It's great, but like, I want to yeah. be remembered for more than that. You know? Yeah, and, and I mean, he's tried to return to the blockbuster roots and do big movies. So I mean, he still has a name that. Yeah, no matter what anybody wants to say, like if you put him as a leading role on anything, people are going to watch it, whether whether it's good or not. I mean, and he's like, I mean, what's the? He didn't he do a movie with uh, Margot and Margot Robbie where it was like he was a con artist or something like that. That um, sounds familiar. And, and it seemed like the entire thing was like a sunglasses commercial. Um, <laughs> uh, Focus. Yes, that was the name of it. Focus. Yes. Um, and he's done other movies that are very much close to this and like in that same vein of like men in black, like the one where he had like the doppelganger, uh, Gemini man. Yep. Um, so I think he's tried to get close to that again, but I just think the older and older he gets, he's kind of out of that, you know, leading man for blockbuster movies vibe now. And I mean, I almost feel like he didn't get the, he didn't get the credit and the acclaim he should have gotten for his more mature acting roles then. And I think that kind of stifled him creatively. Yeah. Like, I think he, 
I think he hit a he had a run once he did Ali where he was doing some of his best acting. And I'm not sure if people give him his flowers for that. Yeah. I'll bite. I, I, I think that's, uh, no, I'm, I'm on board with that. I think that's, uh, I think that's on point. Everything you said, I think makes, it makes total sense to me. I'm just sitting here watching. Uh, and it's, it's the point in which, you know, everything sort of turns and it, it as we try to like sort of narrow this thing down here, I, I we talked about this as sort of the boy, boy who cried wolf kind of flick in a lot of ways. But man, when everything turns south, son of lieutenant believes him. Even his grandmother believes him. We didn't even talk about his grandmother. She's awesome in this movie. Um, yes. So good. And like, she's got her own robot. She won the lottery and she's got her own AI and it's her own NS5. And but when they all turn, all over the, the the city, it looks like. He's like, you know, some somehow I told you so doesn't quite cut it. I'm like, that's great. Now they all see well, this guy wasn't losing his mind after all. I mean, yeah, just to see I, that he was right. Crazy. Yeah. Well, you've got armies of these things running around and, you know, telling people to stay in their homes. And all of a sudden, it's totally different when those red lights come on. And now they look menacing. And, oh, they're um, crawling up the, up the side of the building. Yes. Um, so yeah, yeah, he he looks absolutely correct at that point. Yeah. But again, you know, they looked all unassuming before with the you know translucent um, body parts and all this other stuff, and then all of a sudden that red light comes on, and something about that red light that just looks like, oh my god, like you get this thing out of here, <laughs> shoot it. <laughs> well, you know, hey man, all I know is that the lightsabers of the Sith are red. That's a big deal. Uh, red means evil, kids. Yeah. And most time, it, it and when it's not, it's white. It's maybe very light blue here and there. Blue's the good side. It's the green. It's the blues. It's the white. So yeah. But red saber is a different thing altogether. Um, so you're talking about how big Will Smith still is, and I submit that he is. I I fully agree. A sequel to this movie happens. I think right now, as soon as they want it to happen, if Will Smith made a phone call and said, you know what. I think I want to do a part two. Can we make this happen? I mean, I kind of think a sequel would be fast track. Cause I mean, if the guy says he wants to do it and he's on board and someone says, Hey, I've got a great story. We can adapt it. We can make it this. Yeah. That'd be interesting think, stuff. Yeah. I think once he gets on board, I think that's half of the fight with a lot of these studios. Once you get a big name in, involved, then all right, it's off to the races. Like, well, well, we can we can green light this and get money behind it if we have a name like Will Smith on it. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if they should. It feels like it's a few years too late. <laughs> Very true. You know, and I'm probably, you know, a few years is an understatement. Probably, you know, too late at this point. But I would imagine that, I mean, still, like if he decided tomorrow that, I want to do another Men in Black movie or mm. something or do like a spinoff. They would try to accommodate them because they would feel like the money's there. I agree totally. Um, and, you know, again, because, you know, I'm a nerd, right? Uh, but I'm sitting here in my head thinking, well, you know, here's how you could play a sequel. Were there just robots in Chicago in 2035 or were they all over the, the country? Were they all over the world? Did they all revolt like these the ones here did? What happened? Like, Suddenly I got questions, Phil, and they're not going to get answered. Um, but you know what? You know what? Maybe there is. And honestly, I can't believe this thing has been addressed as a possible uh, TV show. Because if you get the right streaming service with the right budget, I think this thing becomes. I mean, talk about taking your time with the story and really diving deep onto the whole nuances of, you know, I'm living with this thing. It's just here. It's it's harmless, but is it really harmless? I mean, it's like there might be some good storytelling here to be had, especially if it was like a twelve episode season on a streaming service. Where they could just take their time, man. Yeah, I think it would be much better as a TV show as opposed to like a outright sequel. Mm-hmm. Um, like if it was just like a, a TV show based off based in that same world, I think yeah. that could be interesting. Yeah, I'd be here for that. Well, as it stands, kid, we, kids, we've got the one movie, so you either enjoy it or you don't. Uh, if you're looking for something deep and meaningful, you may not find it here, or you may, depending on how di- how far you want to dig. Some people find stuff, um, some people see what they want to see, 
And other people just sort of dig up stuff that really isn't there, but it makes them feel good, I suppose, if you want to put it that way. Um, Phil, give me uh, give me what you think about this film, man. What uh, What's your last word on iRobot? Uh, I think it's a fun movie if you're just looking for like a quick sci-fi movie you just want to look at and it has like some cool action scenes. Um, not sure how well it is aged in terms of like special effects and everything, but I still think it's an entertaining movie. I don't think it's bad. Uh, you were talking about, you know, how well it's aged. I think it looks good. I think in the moments when they're standing still and there's not action, I think it looks pretty good. In the moments when there's action, uh, not bad. But like if you really closely look, it's like, eh, you can kind of see. But, you know, that you run the risk with that with any sci-fi movie. Even with the technology we have today, you can still sort of figure things out. But um, I, I think it holds up from a technology perspective. I think it does for the most part. Um, but like Phil said, kids, if you just want a fun popcorn sci-fi movie, this is probably the one for you. Don't go digging too much. But, you know, Will Smith's the man. I still enjoy his work. And I think if uh, you want to appreciate the guy's body of work, then I think iRobot should be included in that conversation. So the next time you do a marathon of Will Smith flicks, include iRobot because I think it's worth your time. And that is iRobot. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Check out our social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 6 M Podcast. We'll see you next time.